our last presentation before lunch, so we're going to be timely on that. Uh, we're going to spend about a half an hour talking about an issue that doesn't directly relate to the deflection uh, VSIM 0 and 1, but in a larger sense, it, it does relate, that, relate to that, and I'll explain that as we go ahead. We're going to be focusing on uh, Veterans Treatment Court, and by each one of our sessions each year, we try to do something with Veterans Treatment Court. And this year, we're dedicating uh, 30 minutes to focusing on one particular aspect of Veterans Treatment Courts, the prosecutor's role. And the reason we spe uh, selected the prosecutor's role is that that individual plays a very unique um, role in being a treatment team member of a Veterans Treatment Court. And we're focusing on two counties, Cuyahoga County, where I was a prosecutor before I became a judge. And as a judge, I was the Veterans Treatment Court individual who started that court along with, with the permission and, and cooperation of my fellow jurists. In addition, we're going to be talking about uh, having a prosecutor from Warren County, Southern Ohio, talk about uh, his experience as a prosecutor and working for uh, a Veterans Treatment Court in Warren County. Um, and I mentioned that the prosecutor has a unique role that's different from the other participants in two ways. One is the prosecutor has to take into account the victims involved with the crime and the community in which the crime took place. And in, in involving that individual, that defendant in a criminal case, and then having that individual participate in Veterans Treatment Court places the prosecutor in a very interesting role of being a treatment court member and the most important word of tr Veterans Treatment Court, in my view, is the word treatment. So the prosecutor has to be concerned about and interested in treatment while at the same time being concerned about and interested in and protecting the interest of the victim and the community. So we thought it would be worth a half hour to uh, talk about that issue. Uh, just a little bit about uh, the Veterans Treatment Court in Cuyahoga County. Uh, I have some stats that may interest you. Uh, it has an average of 52 individuals participating at any one point in time. When I was Veterans Treatment Court and before COVID, <clears throat> we had over 100 members in our Veterans Treatment Court, and it's by far the largest in the state of Ohio and regionally. The average uh, for the, the percentage of high and moderate risks are 65% of the participants are at that risk level. The highest percentage by race is African American at 58% on an average. The highest percentage by age is over 35, 83%. The veterans identified by the uh, uh, Veterans uh, Service Selection System uh, managed by the VA is 100%. So we use that system to identify those veterans. The um, graduation rate uh, twice a year ranges from 10 to 15 uh, per graduation. And uh, all of this information is on your materials on site, so when you download that, you can get additional information, including the improvements that they have made to the plan of the Veterans Treatment Court in the last couple of years. Uh, we're going to have two presenters uh, this afternoon. We were going to have three. Uh, Warren Griffin from the Cuyahoga County called me last night and said uh, his twin daughters, who are school age, were sick and he needed to be home and I said you need to be there as well. So he was unable to make it. We are going to be using his slide and if you can place that slide up, we'll take a look at that. Um, and when they find it, I'll, we'll talk about it because I, this was his slide and I think it really identifies the role uh, of the prosecutor and the concerns the prosecutor uh, has to deal with. Our first speaker is also from Cuyahoga County, Glenn Randam. He's been an assistant county prosecutor for the last 14 years. And from 2015 to 2021, he volunteered to serve as one of the prosecutors on the Veterans Treatment Court 
from its inception, and he uh, was the lead prosecutor from 2017 to 2021. And uh, the slide is up there now, and I think this is really an appropriate sl sl slide of walking the tightrope. Uh, and if you can imagine the prosecutor trying to uh, manage that tightrope on an individual basis, you'll get some idea of the issues that they uh, have to deal with. Um, Glenn also is in the major trial unit and special victim sections focusing uh, prosecutions on sexual assault, child endangering, patient abuse, and elder abuse crimes. He also has experience in prosecuting uh, homicide, assault, drug, property, financial, and other felony matters. And following Glenn from Warren County is John Arnold. Uh, John is an assistant prosecutor in Warren County. He served as a prosecutor uh, in that capacity on the Veterans Treatment Court since 2018. He is an active, um, he is a uh, uh, U.S. Army uh, member, served in the Judge Advocates uh, Service for a number of years and continued his service in the reserves for 25 years, retiring as a lieutenant colonel uh, in the Army. So he has uh, also been a prosecutor in Hamilton County for, I think, 25 or so years. So he's a very experienced prosecutor. Um, also in your materials, when I was the judge, and I think in 2018, I did a survey or prepared a survey for all of the Veterans Treatment Court judges. At that time, there were 22. I think there are 29 courts. And that information is available to you, and I think it, it would be interesting, I think you would find, if you take a look at that, I've summarized that survey. It's a very lengthy survey, and I ask all of the Veterans Treatment Courts, how do you operate? And one of the questions I ask is, must the prosecuting attorney approve a veteran before the judge can accept that veteran in the Veterans Treatment Court? Uh, you may be surprised to hear the answers to that question. 59% said no, the prosecutor cannot be the final judge as to whether or not someone comes into Veterans Treatment Court. The judge makes that decision. The prosecutor may have a role in advocating or not advocating for that individual, but it's the judge's final decision. Um, but 41% um, said the prosecutor makes the decision. Interestingly, in the municipal level, it was 50% the prosecutor makes the decision and 50% the judge makes the decision. So that's the first indication of what the dynamics are with regard to the judge's role and the prosecutor's role. Because if the prosecutor has final say, then uh, you're likely to get a different makeup than if the judge has a final say in, in the uh, selection of those who can participate. Related to that is what is the nature of your court with regard to the types of felonies or serious misdemeanors you're willing to accept. 46% of all of the veterans treatment courts at that time, all 22 of them, would admit any felony committed in the state of Ohio, a felony one, which is the most serious, uh, to a felony five, which is the least serious. And 36% uh, would accept the only accept felonies three, four, and five, which are the lesser felonies. So you're going to get a different makeup with your veterans treatment court. You're going to get different considerations as to uh, permitting a person with a felony two or a felony one to be in a veterans treatment court. And I think you can appreciate and understand those dynamics. Um, and a, the prosecutor is on a, the treatment team for veterans treatment courts in 98% of the cases and only one or two uh, municipal courts did not have the prosecutor uh, as a member of the treatment team. So that's a little background on the dynamics of a prosecutor's role. Uh, now I think we'll have Glenn come up and talk about Veterans Treatment Court particularly as his experience. And I think he has a couple of examples that I think fit with the theme of this uh, seminar today, deflection. One of the goals of Veterans Treatment Court is to impose the least serious penalty, impose the least serious 
uh, sanction possible to get the best result for that veteran through whatever treatment programs that veteran goes through. So that I idea of deflection-related thinking carries over in the Veterans Treatment Court, and I think Glenn will have some experiences that will share with you that, that concept. Glenn? Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Judge Jackson. Um, full disclosure first, I'm not a veteran. Um, and back when um, I was approached to join Veterans Treatment Court, um, I had a lot of reservations about doing that, namely because I'm not a veteran. Um, but you know, speaking with Judge Jackson, excuse me, uh, Judge Judge Jackson, um, he basically relayed the information to me that you don't need to be a veteran to care about veterans' issues and helping veterans in the system. Um, and it's really, um, you know. Are we going to try to do the best we can to help people and do the right thing? And you know, um, in our community, um, and in most communities, I think there there are a lot of people who haven't served in the military. And in some jurisdictions, you might not have um, prosecutors who have served in the military as well. Even in a jurisdiction as big as ours, we have 34 judges in our common police court. Our office is over 150 people, and we. Um, we don't have any judges currently who are veterans, and even in our office, we have some veterans who are in the prosecutor's office, but maybe um, they aren't assigned in a particular unit that could help with veterans court, or to be honest with you, they're not interested. Um, so in, in my role and in my experience in, in working with the Veterans Treatment Court, um, I've learned that it's just, it, it sounds basic, but it's just really important to listen to veteran viewpoints on the team. Um, the perspectives that they have will help guide and understand the needs of any veteran coming into uh, Veterans Treatment Court uh, who are under consideration. And then those viewpoints and, and those perspectives help guide you in speaking with victims as to why you think a particular veteran might be good for the program. Um, I think there's a general um, worry about prosecutors appearing to be soft on crime. Um, when people come in um, and they're looking to um, look for a plea bargain where they avoid prison where they normally would be going to prison for the crime they committed, or um, a veteran um, looking for an outcome where they would get probation on the Veterans Treatment Court. Um, but um, having the perspectives uh, from veterans on the team and listening to that and, and being able to explain um, those reasons and circumstances and, 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 and things that they could tell you uh, helps getting victims on board and explaining to them why you think um, a particular person uh, who victimized them should get a chance on probation, should get a chance uh, to participate in the program. Um, and quite frankly, I think in, in, in our court, having the victim on board is really important in another way because then when they are on board, and we work something out with a plea bargain where that veteran can participate in Veterans Treatment Court, they know that victim is actually supporting them as well. And that helps, I think, in them going forward with the program and their uh, recovery. Um, so in looking at uh, Veterans Treatment Court as a treatment opportunity and steps to take in to protect the community, um, quite frankly, we take hard cases. We take the cases that uh, veterans have committed high-level felonies, and would likely end up in prison. Um, the veterans who appear beyond help ones are the ones who could benefit the most from the program. Um, you see people all of a sudden uh, working the program and they have a steady job and they have stable housing and they're making connections at the VA. Uh, they're engaging with the VA. They're getting the mental health treatment that they've been avoiding. Um, and they aren't um, committing new crimes and picking up new cases. Um, and um, in, in, in looking at uh, the veteran's progress in the treatment court, um, you know there's going to be ups and downs, and you have to know as the prosecutor um, assigned to it that they're likely going to relapse and they're likely going to mess up or has, have some hiccups along the way. And um, sometimes um, the initial reaction from a prosecutor would be to um, 
overreact and to want them kicked out of the program or a high level sanction or something like that, and that just doesn't work. Um, initial reactions can't be like that. Um, we have to take in consideration what can we do to help the veteran make a better choice next time. Is that a GPS monitor? Is that um, an alcohol monitor? Is that increased testing? Is that calling a mentor? Um, you have to have more tolerance with violations and, and, and not try to um, torpedo that person being in the program because if you stick with them long enough, usually you do get that turnaround where all of a sudden they're on track and they're not committing those violations and, um, and, and they're succeeding. Um, and kind of speaking what Judge Jackson talked about, um, sanctions not being disproportionate to the violation, uh, we want them to be honest about the violation uh, and take responsibility uh, for themselves in front of the other participants in front of the other participants and continue working on treatment. Um, when I was working on the court with Judge Jackson, that was one of the, the big things we tried to encourage. We had a setting where um, the veterans were all listening and, and um, paying attention to the violations. And it was really important for us for the veteran to come and take responsibility in front of the group amongst their fellow veterans, in front of them, in front of the judge. And we would see it sometimes that throughout the week, maybe they were you know, um, giving really um, untruthful reasons to their um, positive test to the probation officer. But then when we got to court, they took responsibility. And that taking responsibility for themselves in front of their peers and the judge, um, we think obviously helped in um, them um, going forward with their recovery. Um, but going back and talking about taking the hardest cases where people will usually end up in prison, there's one in particular that sticks out in my mind. Um, this was a, a veteran who had served two years, um, I'm sorry, two tours in Afghanistan. And um, what happened is he uh, was really drunk and driving, and he crashed his car into um, a Cleveland police officer's car um, and injured the one officer in the car. Uh, the other officer got out, and this veteran um, in his intoxicated state started fighting with that officer um, and trying to reach for his gun. So what kind of charges do we have here? We have felonious assault in a police officer, felony one, with one and three-year gun specs because he's trying to get the uh, officer's gun. We have aggravated robbery, uh, felony one, with one and three-year gun specs. We have a list of other um, offenses. And um, that was probably, like I said, the hardest case we had to take because not only did you commit horrible high-level felonies and injure police officers in the city of Cleveland, um, you're, you're looking at um, substantial time. And um, what we did, um, we got information from the Veterans Administration from the VA, we got their medical records, um, found out the history of the veteran and, and uh, um, with their mental health status and, and their physical health. We also got um, information from the Vet Center um, and learned about what they were um, talking about in therapy sessions with their uh, counselor there and they had provided releases for all this. And then we went back and, and spoke with those police officers who were involved we spoke with the other prosecutors handling the case, and to be quite frank, I had to work against them a little bit um, be, to, to try to get this veteran into the program. But after doing all that work, um, learning about the horrible things that this veteran had experienced over in Afghanistan, which contributed to their heavy uh, alcohol abuse, uh, we were able to work out a plea bargain with support of the police officers, one of which happened to be a veteran himself, and um, this individual pled to uh, felony of, felonies of the second degree without any gun specifications. Um, and then they were subsequently led into the program and they successfully completed the program after, it took them a little longer, they had a, this person had a relapse, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but they successfully completed the program and, and that might be the best example of somebody who uh, under any other circumstance would have gotten um, a prison sentence, would have went to prison for a really long time. Um, but we were able to divert this um, person into a program and address the real issue of what was going on. Um, the alcohol abuse, um, which came from the trauma that this person had experienced in Afghanistan. 
Um, and that's what I mean when I say t taking the hard cases. Um, is there a risk of looking, um, uh, was there a risk of um, looking weak on crime, I guess, so to speak, when you take cases like this and um, other people who um, are typically going to prison? Yes, but um, these are the cases that we think are important. These are the cases that, um, why we're here for. And we, we think those are the people you could offer the most help. One of the interesting things we noticed in our court when we started is we thought we would have a lot of veterans coming in from the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we were actually getting veterans, a lot of veterans initially on um, from uh, Vietnam War, from, uh, the, from Desert Storm. And these are people who um, had gone through the system before, had, had picked up felony cases before, and maybe necessarily didn't get any treatment um, or help then. Um, and then um, working with them and, and working with the victims and, and talking about um, sanctions that would be in place if they, if they continue to not abide um, and, and things like that, we were able to, to work towards getting um, them help. And um, talking about the importance of the prosecutor regarding the success of Veterans Treatment Court and the positive influence for those participating, um, the prosecutor obviously has to have buy-in um, to the program. We originally had a prosecutor who didn't have buy-in. Um, it doesn't really work when you're not willing to uh, believe in the program. Um, and in looking at um, being trauma-informed when you're speaking with victims and working with victims, you also have to be trauma-informed when working with that veteran and as to why they're there. Um, it's also helpful, obviously, if the participants um, in the program know that, they, that you want them to succeed. Um, usually, uh, from the feedback I've gotten, this is the first time a defendant who's come to um, court um, or who's come to court multiple times has been um, posit positively impacted or they felt like they were positively impacted by the prosecutor on the case. The prosecutor wants the best outcome for them and that um, we've noticed does go a long way in helping them with success um, going forward. Um, and um, to cover some of the items that my colleague uh, was going to cover, just uh, about walking that tightrope and embracing the non-adversarial approach. Um, one of the things that we started doing is not engaging in post-conviction litigation. So some, a lot of times uh, things would come up in treatment team um, with regard to um, them wanting driving privileges or a motion to lift a no contact order or whatever the situation is. And sometimes it was easy enough to work out, sometimes it's not. Um, and when it's not, uh, we've, we just have other prosecutors who were originally assigned to the case work with that because we wanna maintain um, a good relationship with the other people on the team, including the public defender. Um, and we, we don't want to uh, upset that balance on the team. And then also, in embracing that non-adversarial approach, um, making sure that we're championing the clinician's perspective. Um, the, the social workers, the clinicians, the people providing the services probably have the most insight on what they think um, would be most helpful, and uh, making sure their voices are elevated and listened to is important. And I think that's about all I have, so thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I know that I'm um, standing between you and lunch, so we'll try to address that quickly. Uh, I am an Army veteran. I was an Army attorney for a number of years, and I've been a prosecutor for a long time. Um, and I'm an old school prosecutor. So my experience in Veterans Court, especially initially, was kind of contrary to everything I learned as a prosecutor growing up. And I will tell you how long I've been a prosecutor. When Dave Corlett and his partner came out of the police academy and hit the street, I was past being a baby prosecutor at that time. I'd been in the office 10 or 15 years. Warren County is a lot different from Cuyahoga County. Obviously, we're on the other end of the state. Uh, we have a, a population of about 250,000. We're right between Cincinnati and Dayton. Um, so we have a more conservative population, slightly higher income. 
but we have two interstates to go through our county, and we have two prisons, and that creates all kinds of problems. I'd like to tell you that, and I thought when I first went to Warren County, we don't have all the problems you see in Cincinnati or Dayton. That's not true. We may have fewer of them, but we still have the same variety. Have I seen everything? Can I tell you that it's never going to be like Cincinnati or Dayton? No, because that may have changed last night or tomorrow or the next day. But again, we are Bengals country for the most part, with one of my exception, one of my distinguished co colleagues back there, Reds country. And in 2015, we started our first veterans court in the county court, with the misdemeanor court with Judge Gary Loxley. Uh, in 2018, we expanded to a common pleas or felony level court. I will add since then, Judge Loxley has worked with our municipal courts throughout the county and kind of has blended a lot of their veterans into his docket as well. We probably average about 15 participants at any one time. We have both low risk and high risk tracks, although very few of our veterans are on the low risk uh, track. Probably two thirds or more or of our veterans who come into the program are successfully discharged. Uh, over half of them are Army veterans. Uh, the others mostly Marines and Air Force. We have the occasional sailor, and I don't think we've ever had a Coastie, and I'm sure we haven't had anybody from the Space Force yet. Um, but less than 10% of our veterans are female. And our court coordinator gave me this stat uh, when I was preparing for this, and I found it absolutely amazing, and I'm not even sure I believe it, but in 2023, 96% approximately of our drug screens were negative. I know that in our veteran court treatment meetings, I spend 96% of the time talking about the ones that are positive, and I'm sure that happens on any criminal docket. Um, but we have an aggressive drug testing program and by and large compliance with that. Our ages range from the early 20s to one veteran who came in when he was 69 years of age. I'm sure, I know he was 70 when he finally graduated a couple of months ago. And we take all levels and sizes and shapes of offenses on the felony level. That includes serious violent offenses. Sometimes those are come, that come to us by way of judicial release we have a lot of felony domestic violence cases, weapons cases, felony DUIs, and even some non-support cases. We also take all levels of discharges. And we take people who did not receive, quote, an honorable discharge or may not be VA eligible because they did their time in the National Guard or the uh, Military Reserve. As I said, I've been the prosecutor in our felony court since its inception. We do not, I do not have a veto over candidates. And in fact, we're not really involved in that selection or triage of those people until uh, the very last moment, if you will. Our triage begins typically in our jail. Our pretrial services people are always asked if the person's been in the military. They used to say, are you a veteran? But I think we've restructured those questions a little bit more to be more expansive. And most of those veterans cases have been staffed by the time that criminal felony case gets to either sentencing or the ILC hearing, if that's appropriate, or judicial release. And for all practical purposes, the decision has kind of been made at that point in time. We do consider plea bargaining with certain veterans. Uh, you know, I've done it myself where a kid came in who had a lot of drugs and he was in the National Guard. Well, rule number one, if you get convicted of a felony with a lot of drugs, you're out, whether it's the Guard, Reserve, anywhere. But we were able to work him into a uh, lower level offense, put him into the ILC program, put him into Veterans Court, and he had a successful graduation. Um, at sentencing or at the ILC hearing or at the judicial release hearing, the judge orders these individuals to be referred to Veterans Court. They're staffed by our treatment team and then accepted by the court. We have two veterans hospitals that serve our area, Cincinnati and Dayton, and we're very blessed by that because our VJOs from those hospitals are very active participants. 
And in fact, they're usually ahead of the game compared to the rest of us. Our County Veterans Service Commission is very supportive. They're also a very active uh, veterans or service organization in terms of transportation and outreach. And it's not unusual that we'll have one or more of their commissioners uh, attend Veterans Court or all the uh, Veterans Commission attend our graduation ceremonies. They're a good source for not only relief, but transportation and, and other services. It's important, I think, to ha that we have good support from our law enforcement agencies. Our sheriff bought into it at uh, day one, and that sets a tone for the other agencies throughout the county, including the other police chiefs. We're lucky that we have good support from non-VA mental health services, county mental health services, and a lot of non-custodial options for veterans, maybe residential uh, options such as the Joseph House and so forth. And probably I think one of the most important things is we have a good community support from non-governmental agencies. Uh, we have something called Project Rise Above, which specifically grants emergency relief to veterans in for financial reasons. Uh, we have a Plan for Life program, a financial planning program. Uh, we recently added something called Mustang Journey, which involves not training, but just sort of familiarizing Mustangs that have been captured and brought here to be domesticated. And uh, one of the outshoots of our program, and in fact one of our graduates became active in the Veterans Suicide Prevention Coalition for our county. As, as you said earlier, the prosecutor walks a tight line. And I'm sometimes the old crabby guy who says no, or enough is enough. I've occasionally sat next to one of my VGOs and shocked the, you know, what out of her when I said, well, th we've come so far with this guy, just give him one more chance. Uh, I'm not sure that's a treatment program, but I think we've invested a lot of time and resources into him. And I'll tell you, this guy had, he had checked all the boxes to go back to prison. He had been on probation, not done very well, domestic violence situations, and then went to a gun range in another county, big no-no, eventually got revoked, set to prison, out of Veterans Court, shocked back into Veterans Court, and we're still working with him. And I will, I'll tell you, the book's still open on him. I, I, it's also our job to make sure that we comply with state law mandates. Uh, one of the problems we have or situation we, we encounter are felony OVIs. There's mandatory jail time sentences. And we have one young man who they put off doing his 60 days, they put off doing his 60 days, and we really didn't think he needed to be in a cell at night with another person because of some of his problems. And uh, my compliments to our probation officers and our staff and the jail staff, they worked with him, you know, and at one point there was a consideration he'd get litter gear, which meant he had to move into a general population a pod. He didn't want to do that because he didn't want to be out in that general population at night sleeping in a, a basically a barracks or communal area. Um, Marcy's Law has had an, somewhat of an impact on our court. Our office, and I think most prosecutors' offices, have always given great deference to the input to the wishes of victims, as well as law enforcement officers. Marcy's Law, as it was incorporated into a constitutional amendment in the state of Ohio, gave more teeth to that. And I think I remember one of our first veterans court treatment sessions where I said, well, look, the victim's not going to buy into that. And I think somebody was aghast that a victim could object to this wonderful treatment program that they had worked out. And I said, well, you know, this is a felony domestic violence case. There's a reason why the victim may have a problem with taking off the monitor or doing whatever. Uh, so we ensure that victims and their rights are protected and that they have an opportunity to be heard. And candidly, that's not always consistent with what the treatment providers want to do. You know, as a military prosecutor, my goal was to maintain the good order and discipline of the armed forces. As a state court prosecutor, my goal is to uh, maintain the peace and dignity of the state of Ohio. 
The goal of our Veterans Court is to restore veterans to a place of honor based on their service. From the prosecutor's standpoint, that also includes responsibility and accountability. And sometimes we have to hold those people to that standard. Great successes we've had by participants. They graduate, they come back and serve as mentors. We've had some tragic stories as well. And so in closing, I'm struck by the thought that no matter how successful your Veterans Court program is, those people all need our support. They need mentors. They need to continue to enjoy the support that we provide to them long past Veterans Court dockets. I see that I'm being looked at by the Chief, by the Justice, so I will step down. Thank you very much. <laughs>